G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as True Footy reacts to round three. First up in this edition of True Footy Reacts, I've got to talk about a game that was very close to my heart. I'm stoked to say that on Saturday night, the Eagles made a big statement about their 2019 Premiership credentials. Like somebody said recently, I can't remember who it was, but the Eagles are almost the most forgotten about reigning Premiers. I get it, there's the MCG factor, and when they play in a grand final, they're more than likely going to be playing against the Victorian team. But to still be third in the betting behind both Geelong and Collingwood, despite the Saturday night's result, does seem a little strange to me. We saw the Eagles bring back some important reinforcements. Andrew Gaff made his much anticipated return and Jamie Cripps bobbed up with four goals as well. Those two were arguably the two best Eagles on the field. There was also some beautiful irony in it being Dom Sheed who kicked the winning goal from the pocket. <laughs> I gotta say, I did appreciate that cheeky little smile as well. Unfortunately, one of the biggest talking points out of that game seems to be that sliding free kick that was played against Collingwood. Don't get me wrong, I definitely don't think that should be a free kick, but I do think it's probably dramatized a little bit by the fact that the Eagles got a 50 meter penalty and kicked a goal out of it. To be honest though, I definitely think the 50 meter penalty should have been paid. Yes, you can argue Phillips probably wouldn't have expected that free, free kick against him, but equally, he stands up, turns his back on the umpire, and the umpire is clearly pointing towards the Eagles. Hold it, I've been clear, he's got to look and see, I'm pointing clearly this way. And equally, how could it possibly have been a free kick to Phillips? I do think he's unlucky, but the 50 meter penalty was fair enough. Ultimately though, it was a great game, and I do have the utmost respect for the Pies. I got a feeling that won't be the last time the Eagles and Pies play the MCG this year. Now, we talked about it a bit last week, so I don't want to labour on it, but we have to discuss the fact that Melbourne are now 0-3. Following that pretty disappointing loss to the Dons on Friday night, you have to say the Demons are in a real bad place. With regard to their finals chances, they're in dangerous territory. Now, to their credit, I actually thought it was a half-decent game on Friday night. It was high scoring, the skill level was decent, which is more than you could say about their first two efforts. But it was a must-win game, so internally they must be extremely disappointed. Overall, the game had its swings, and I, as I said, I thought they played okay, but to concede eight goals in 21 minutes was ultimately telling, and it was too much for them to bridge. Now, historically, teams who go 0-3 and three don't make the finals. I think Sydney did it a few years ago, but not many teams other than that have actually done it. Melbourne's probably going to need to win at least 13 of their last 19. So can they do it? I think with the talent they have on the list, you have to say yes. It's a credit to Goodwin. He came yes. out after the game and said the Ds have no excuses with regards to pre-season and being underdone, that they should be judged on their performances. The thing is, they've got another tough game this week against the Swans over at the SCG. They can certainly win it, but it's probably 50-50 at best at this stage, and if they go 0-4, I probably won't have the same confidence in them anymore. Next up, I'd like to pay a bit of recognition to a much maligned player that is finally hitting his straps at AFL level. Jack Billings had an excellent game on the weekend, kicking two goals and had 31 possessions against Fremantle. This season, he's averaging 29.3 disposals and five marks a game. Last year, he averaged just 22 disposals, so that's a big jump up from what he was producing last year. Given how talented he is and the Saints strike rate of their talent in recent years, He's a real key player going forward. There's been a lot of talk about him moving clubs to try and capture his potential, but finally he's starting to show that he is the player we thought he was. Now, Tom Mitchell might be missing most of this season due to a broken leg, but we may have found his heir apparent in Lockie Neal. Now, Lockie Neal has been a pretty understated player in recent years. He's actually been good for a while, but because he's been in a struggling Fremantle team over in Perth, probably hasn't got the recognition he deserves. That being said, he's put together two 40 plus possession games in a row and you'd have to say he's probably close to leading the Brownlow count at the moment. He's averaging 38 possessions and 10 clearances a game after three rounds. With Tom Mitchell out of the way, Lockie Neal's probably the most consistent midfielder in the game. And while I don't think he's the best player in the game, I think he's a good chance to win the Brownlow. So keep an eye on that. Now, Jeremy Cameron is a player who probably hasn't delivered on his prodigious talent in recent years. But we are starting to see him put it together in a big way in 2019. On the weekend, as you all would have seen, he completed the rare feat of kicking seven goals and having 30 possessions in a game. These days, that's almost unheard of, but I'm led to believe Lee Matthews did it five times in his career. I think Cameron scored over 60 goals in two of his first four seasons, but he hasn't really done a lot since. At the moment, he finds himself a distant leader of the Coleman medal with 14, and the next best is 10. He's a seriously special talent, and with regard to GWS's flag chances, he's a seriously key player too. So, it's only been three rounds, but I thought it'd be fun to have a look at who we think are the Premiership contenders this early. Now, it is way too early, and we're going to make ourselves look ridiculous by tipping a top four after round three. 
but it's kind of fun to see what people's impressions are of the best team so far. I'm gonna have a stab and say Geelong, West Coast, Collingwood, and then Brisbane are gonna be our top four this year. Now Brisbane is the one I named that people are gonna be scratching their heads over or probably abuse me in the comments. But just go have a look through their fixture. They have a lot of winnable games all throughout the year to be honest. The big question over them will be, can the young players sustain their form throughout the whole season? With young sides, there's always the risk that they're gonna get tired before this season runs out. And I admit that is a huge possibility. But to be honest, they are playing really good football. And I do think they actually have quite a bit of established quality already on the list. I reckon they're a smoky for top four, although I don't really consider them a premiership contender. Let me know in the comments what you think the top four will be at the end of the season, knowing it's just gonna be fun, okay guys? Don't rag on each other. At the other end of the table, we've got to consider the spoon contenders so far. To be honest, no one's really jumping out at me. I would have said Gold Coast at the start of the year, but they find themselves two and one and very close to being three and oh. They're not playing like spoon contenders at all. St Kilda are another one that will probably in the frame for spoon predictions, but like Gold Coast, they're only five points off being three and zip. I hate to say it because Carlton have actually been pretty encouraging this season so far, but because they haven't registered a win yet, they've put themselves probably as the favorite. North and Melbourne are winless as well so far, but realistically, I don't see either of them as genuine spoon contenders. And it's the same with SNN. They're probably gonna have a real purple patch somewhere throughout the year. But that's why Gold Coast and Carlton this week at Metricon is a really interesting game. Can't believe I'm saying that. But I'll be intrigued because if Carlton lose that and Gold Coast go three games clear, Maybe. they might have consigned themselves to being wooden spoon favorites already. Now I wanna bring up another topic that has found its way back into circulation since Essendon's playing pretty shit football. With Wusher under a bit of pressure, people are discussing whether or not James Hurd should return to the coaching ranks at AFL level. It's interesting, we found pretty diverse opinions on this topic, but personally, I think no way in hell. Look, I know he's been through some really tough times, especially with his mental health, so I don't wanna heap shit on the guy. And he's probably paid his dues with what he's been through, but I really don't think that means you should let him back to the scene of the crime. The doping saga was probably the biggest cheating scandal we've had in Australian sport. It was also only six years ago. I honestly think, and I have nothing against the guy, but to let him back to his old job after just six years, or even if it's within 10 or 15 years, would be an absolute disgrace. I don't hate the guy. I don't want anyone to abuse him or boo him because, you know, he's been through a lot. Because similar to Andrew Gaff, it's probably one of those things where he's probably tortured himself more than anyone else could. But equally, I think it would just be a very weak stance from the AFL should they let him resume his post at the club again, even if it's at a different club. I don't want him shunned from AFL society. If he wants to do things like present a North Earth medal, or if he wants to be in the AFL media, I don't even really care. To be honest, if they let Wayne Carey into the AFL media, they should let James Hurd. I do think Hurd is a terrific coach who made a terrible mistake, but don't forget the players were also victims in that scenario. So if you ask me, it's a flat no on Hurd coaching again. But let me know what you think in the comments. Now on the weekend, as we've all seen a million times through the media, Dusty has found himself in hot water again for two incidents. Firstly, by whacking someone over the back of the head, and secondly, for flipping the bird to who I presume is Shane Mumford and doing a snorting symbol. With regards to the swearing, my personal view is that he should only really be disciplined by the AFL if it's actually a provision in the rules that you can't swear and abuse at each other. Abuse at each other? Abuse each other? Now I'm generally ignorant as to whether there is a provision saying you can't abuse each other verbally. There could be, but if there's not, I don't think the AFL has any right to fine him or do anything. Now, if they wanna go ahead and make it a rule that you can't flip the bird to each other, especially when there's cameras around, I support that. But you can't find the guy if it's not a rule. You can't make up rules on the spot. The AFL love doing that. Oh, it takes me back to the Nick Nat Nui's suspension when he tackled Carl Eamon, where they just made up a rule on the spot and forced it. I don't like Dusty. I don't really condone what he did, but he doesn't deserve a fine. Just make it a rule from now on if you feel strongly about it. Now, the second incident was Martin presumably losing his shit at being tagged so closely that he's gone and whacked the player in the back of the head. Oh, end of the day. Blokes come to watch the number four play. Let the bloke play, it for, play the game. I like Damien Hardwick. I think he's a nice guy, but I think his comments on this topic are absolute bullshit. Are you joking? Let the number four play the game? Is he suggesting that taggers are suddenly now against the spirit of football? What does he want, the football handed to him on a platter? Of course there should be rules governing exactly what taggers can do, but you can't get pissed off just because DeBoer did that much of a good job on Martin and he can't beat a tag. I do respect Hardwick and 
coaches wanting to go into bat for their player, but I think those comments are very silly. Now, I usually like in these videos to give a shout out to the best performed young player of the round. Watching Carlton Sydney, I would have thought Sam Walsh had the nomination this round in the bag. He had 28 possessions and was a real important part of that Carlton midfield. That was until Connor Rosie stood up and kicked a lazy bag of five goals. Along with the five goals, he had 21 possessions and it was a real hot contested game against a really good team. By the time this comes out, Rosie's probably already been given the nomination, but just wanted to give him a little shout out. And funnily enough, Sam Walsh still goes looking for his first nomination, despite three really good opening rounds. Now in the footy tipping, we've had a big surprise pull with Catherine S, AKA Joyce's Misso, winning the round with an impressive seven tips. She was the only person to score seven this round. But big booty bitches, Brendan Courtney, still remains on top of the ladder with 15. Congratulations to those two. Meanwhile, if you watch my tip show every week, you'll see that I'm doing shit. On the fantasy side of things, congratulations to Oscar O with the team Original Crips, I like that name by the way, who scored an impressive 22-48 this round. He scored more than anyone else in the True Footy League, although we still have the Annihilators in first place with Derek F and, and they're on 6,761 points. I don't have it in front of me, but I think Derek is in the top 50 in all of Australia, so. Damn you, Derek, for joining our league. No, I'm just kidding, well done, mate, that's bloody impressive. Anyway guys, that's all we have this week for True Footy Reacts. If you're new to the channel, please consider hitting subscribe. It's been a while since we've done a podcast, so hopefully we're gonna get the old crew back together to do one of those. Otherwise, stay tuned for my weekly tip show, which you'll find right here on the channel. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time.